Hello. So in this video, um, this is a content video um, for the uh, British paper, Britain paper, paper one, Stuart Britain, 1625 to 1701. So this is the first in a series of content videos. Um, and this is video number one. And in this video, I'm going to talk about 1625 to 1649. Um, and this is for topic one, political instability. OK, um, what I'm going to use as I'm going through this video is the Easter revision pack, which I've created and I've used for a few years. Um, and the Easter revision pack is based on, um, I'll just get the, the book actually, it's based on this revision book. OK. Um, so I find this quite good. It breaks down the course quite well. So my revision notes, um, Britain 1625 to 1701. Okay, so um, I think the idea behind this is I'm just gonna talk through content, do a little bit of analysis, talk about some key questions, and then students can use the revision pack and they can edit their own version as I'm going through it. Okay, so Political instability, obviously, before we even get stuck in, you need to have a good definition of what we mean by political instability. So you should have that already. I'm not going to go into that now. Um, you should you should be confident with that. Um, so then what's happening right at the start of Charles the first reign? As you can see here on this page, I have split it up into four key areas. And um, these are kind of factors that you could talk about, factors that led to political instability. So I'm going to go through each one. Another way that you could do this or what you could be doing as I'm talking through it or separately is making a timeline. And I've tried to break it down into kind of bite sized chunks. So I'm not going to go all the way from 25 to 49 in one go. So as you can see here, this first one is 25 to 29. Uh, and then the next one is 29 to 40. And then the next one is 40 to 49. So it's more straightforward to help you to uh, get get into this content. Right. So starting at the start, Charles I comes to the throne and I'm starting on the left with finance. And as you should remember, he inherits an empty treasury. So there, the country's not got much money in debt um, because of foreign wars that his dad was involved with, James I. So that creates instability. And what Parliament do then is they realise the monarch is going to rely on them to raise money because that's what monarchs did. That's how monarchs used Parliament at the time. And so they don't grant Charles I tonnage and pound this exercise duty for life, which is the normal way of doing things. They granted it to him for one year. So that meant that every year he had to go back to Parliament to try and get more money. And throughout this period from 25 to 49, just think about it as a power balance between the monarch and parliament. And parliament are trying to gain more power and Charles is kind of conceding at times and then not conceding. And it's about this power balance. Um, Charles dissolves parliament um, and then because he doesn't have parliament, he uh, is forced to send out this forced loan or call for this forced loan, which is a uh, it's a loan for taxpayers, but they're not going to get it back. That's why it's called the forced loan. Five knights refuse to pay. And that leads to the five knights case in which five knights um, were imprisoned without a trial. OK, so finance, you can see throughout this period, 25 to 49 is a significant cause of instability. Um, you could also link some of those things to Charles the First personality, um, potentially, you know, asking for a forced, forced loan. Also, you could link that to the actions of Parliament. OK. So moving on to religion, Charles is a supporter of Arminianism. Um, he appoints William Lord, the Bishop of London. Lord is a, is a high profile Arminian in 1628. Um, his chief advisor in the early part of his reign is the Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers, who's also an Arminian. 
And this is going to particularly antagonize Puritans, okay? Because Arminianism is seen as pretty much Catholic in all but name, okay? Um, in, in terms of worship. And as well as that, at the start of his reign, 1625, Charles marries Henrietta Maria, who's a French Catholic princess. Again, that's going to really antagonize Puritans. OK, so religion, as, as I'm sure you've heard me say before, is very much intertwined with politics. You can't remove religion from politics. The most vocal opponents of, of Charles in Parliament are Puritans. Um, so and they don't like his religious policies. They don't like the fact he's married to a Catholic. They don't like the fact he's appointing Arminians. OK, so moving on to foreign policy, what's going on here? There's two failed kind of uh, foreign policy expeditions firstly on cadiz in spain and secondly at la rochelle trying to save some french huguenots french protestants and buckingham is blamed for both of these um mistakes they cost a lot of money so whenever you think about war or foreign, po foreign policy expeditions always think about the money that these are going to cost and uh buckingham is blamed who's charles's advisor and he's assassinated in 1626 1628, sorry, uh, he's assassinated in 28. Um, so foreign policy is a cause of uh, political instability in this period too. Finally, problems with parliament. So this could either be um, something to, you know, you could phrase this as the power balance between the monarch and parliament. You could talk about um, the, the, the challenges between the monarch and, and parliament, the disagreements, you know, you could call it something like that. So Charles in this period dissolved parliament four times. 1625, that's really in response to tonnage and poundage. 1626, that's to save um, Buckingham. If you remember, parliament tried to impeach Buckingham, so he dissolved parliament to save him. 1629, that was in response to the three resolutions. And 1640, that was um, the short parliament. So he dissolved parliament four times in his reign. And in this early period, 25, 29, three times. So showing that the actions of the king are a cause of political instability. In 1628, uh, parliament passed the Petition of Right, which criticizes Charles's policies and kind of outlines the powers of Parliament. Um, and in a way, you could see Charles actually signs this. So a good counterpoint for this could be that he is actually conceding some ground here. As I said before, Parliament is filled with Puritans. It's not, not all parliamentarians are Puritans, but the most vocal opposition is led by Puritans, and particularly Pym and his uh, close allies in Parliament, who are known as Pym's Junto. OK, in 1629, Parliament passes the three resolutions and Charles dissolves Parliament. That leads to his personal rule. So in this early period, you can see the main issues there, finance, religion, foreign policy. And then you could take conflict between the monarch and Parliament. OK, so what you could do is kind of analyze the relative importance of each of those in that analysis box. And then you could think about these questions. How successfully did Charles first deal with the problems he encountered? And you could talk about problems to do with finance foreign policy parliament maybe that could be three and then how far do you agree that finance was the most important significant cause of political instability and you'd weigh up finance against another two okay and then think about doing some links so i hope that's clear in that first section 25 to 29. so obviously you can pause the video and make notes and things i'm just going to keep on going here so 29 to 40 so there's a lot going on in this period and this is the period of charles the first's personal rule which ultimately of course failed because he had to recall parliament in 1640. so here are the main um issues the factors that i've identified um in this period as causes of instability so in terms of finance, again, because Charles does not have Parliament to raise taxes, he resorts to other methods of raising money, which is called extraordinary revenue. So some of these are more important and more serious than others. So, for example, uh, fines for building on royal forests, 
Um, landowners who hadn't been knighted were fined. Uh, issuing the soap monopoly in 1634, which becomes this kind of popish soap controversy. It's a Catholic company. And in 1635, the ship money uh, controversy, okay, which I'll come back to in just a little bit. But finance is a key cause of instability. And in terms of how successful this is, you could say that actually, for, you know, for a large part, this is relatively successful. I would argue until the late 1630s, this is relatively successful. OK, um, and then we go on to religion um, and, and religion links to a lot of these other things. So Lord, as we just talked about, he had been the Bishop of London. He's appointed the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's a high profile pu uh, Arminian. Puritans aren't going to be very happy with him. Um, and he's appointed Archbishop of Canterbury. And in the 1630s, following his appointments, he makes lots of changes to the church stained glass windows, moving the altar, introduction of organs, hierarchy, ritual, ceremony, all of those things that Puritans say is moving the church towards, um, more towards Catholic forms of worship. Not only that, but Lord persecutes Puritans who dare to speak out against his changes. So Burton, Bastwick and Prynne have their ears cut off in 1637. And the, the analysis for that can be that public sympathy turned to, pu to the Puritans. So the public started to side with the Puritans against Lord. OK, and then and then you could say that that's actually against the king, isn't it? Because Lord is the king's appointment. So religion, a key cause of instability. However, I would say that, again, did he manage to impose a, a new religious settlement? Yes. Um, until the late 1630s, it was relatively successful. Lordian changes were made. There was kind of grumblings from Puritans, but at this point, it hadn't unraveled. So perhaps public opinion, again, in, by the late 1630s, is starting to change. But actually, for most of the, these 11 years, you could say that religion, the religious changes were carried out with, with relative success. But then we get, get on to Scotland, and this is really, I think, 1637 is a key turning point, and this is where I think the personal rule starts to unravel, okay? So the imposition of the English prayer book leads to riots in St Giles' Cathedral in Edinburgh. Um, that spreads to the lowlands of Scotland, and that leads to the National Covenant being signed, which is like a national petition um, of the godly, as it was thought. So lots of people in Scotland signed that against uh, changes, you know, coming from the top down, challenging kind of hierarchy and Arminianism. Um, that leads to, <coughs> excuse me, the first bishop's war breaking out in 1639. And it, um, it ends very, very quickly. Charles can't get a can't get an army together and there's a taxpayer strike in England because English taxpayers refuse to fund a war against fellow Protestants in Scotland. Um, Charles goes to war again with the Scots, the second bishops war, Scotland win that war and Charles is forced to sign the Treaty of Ripon which gives Scotland £850 a day to stay in Newcastle. Newcastle had coal reserves, and £850 a day in today's money is almost £100,000. So you wouldn't necessarily write that in your essay, but that's a lot of money for the for the monarch to be paying out every day to keep the Scots there, to stop them from invading further down. Um, and so you can see Scotland, I think, is, is a key reason why the personal rule unravels. And if you look at the dates, this is towards the end of the personal rule. So a kind of nice nuanced argument, I think, would be that, you know, if you talk about the personal rule as a whole, Scotland becomes an issue from 37 onwards. So you wouldn't say for the whole of personal rule, Scotland wasn't an issue just towards the end. Okay. And then we go on to the problems with Parliament. So in 1637, again, there's that year again coming up as a turning point, the trial of John Hampton, who was a Puritan MP who refused to pay ship money. Um, and he loses that case seven to five. But the fact that five of the king's judges had voted with John Hampton 
and his and supported him in that shows that public opinion is shifting okay and charles's imposition of ship money and those kind of taxes isn't it's not popular um and then we go on to uh, other issues with parliament the short parliament 1640 charles calls because of the bishops wars only lasts three weeks because they come back with lots of challenges to the king so charles shuts them down again in november 1640 the long parliament is called and they have lord and wentworth arrested and impeached by parliament okay they later both get they get imprisoned and executed um just beyond this time frame so you can see they are the main causes of instability in this period the main problems and you should be able to weigh them up which do you think are most important here are some key questions how successful was charles the first personal rule so again you could focus on how successful was it financially how successful was it um in terms of religion how successful was it in terms of scotland and then you know weigh up the relative successes again i would highlight 1637 as a turning point persecution of Puritans, Hampton trial, and imposition of the prayer book. Those three things, I think, make that year very important for this. Why did Charles I personal rule fail? So again, you could come at it from, there were a number of reasons why it failed short term and long term, finance, religion, Scotland, maybe, yeah? Um, to what extent were issues of religion the most important cause of monarchical problems and then just wear religion against others and making some links okay so that's 1629 to 40 um with some key questions there for you to think about so now we go on to 1640 to 49 um and i have made another video from 1646 to 60 on the republic um which is a very complicated time and it is quite a complicated video so i'm going to go up to 49 here um as well and there's different causes of um instability here so the first one is military involvement in politics um and what happens as the civil so the civil war breaks out in 1642 and what happens as um the war goes on and particularly after the establishment of the new model army is you get a more radical army who are increasingly involved in politics and increasingly unwilling to negotiate and compromise with the king or with parliament even so parliament kind of splits the parliamentary forces split where you've got the army who are more radical and parliament who are less radical as the war goes on we've also got actions of charles and the fact he doesn't compromise he doesn't negotiate when he could have done we've got actions of parliament and then we've got radicals although i would think about that in terms of kind of internal threats maybe um i might actually change that on here because i think that's probably a better um a better way of uh thinking about this let me see if i can actually change that there um so kind of internal threats as a as a factor rather than Radical slash eternal threats rather than rather than limiting it just to radicals. Okay. Um, okay. So um, going through these military involvement in politics. So the new model army is created in 1645. They are a more professional army. They're very, very disciplined. They're very, very religious and increasingly radical okay puritan is leveler influence um in the new model army their ideas are they're they're going around the country and they're spreading those ideas okay um in 1647 um the army uh issue the representation of the army which is a kind of new constitutional settlement it's the idea of uh a kind of negotiation potentially a new a new form of government that the army want to um impose on the country okay and 1647 uh the heads of the proposals again um trying to make some kind of agreement with the king um on uh what a negotiated settlement might, might look like okay um so the army getting involved in politics and perhaps the most important in fact definitely the most important is december 1648 pride's purge 
okay? Um, and Pride's Purge uh, leads to uh, the trial and execution of the king, okay? Um, that is, in modern day terms, you wouldn't call it this in Nessie, but a military coup, okay, where Parliament is is readied by, by Colonel Thomas Pride and the army uh, of moderates, so people who are willing to negotiate with the king. So Thomas Pride goes to Parliament, December 1648, and says to all the moderates, leave. We just want the people who are going to be, be with us on getting rid of the king and it leaves a rump house okay so it's just it's just a smaller parliament that's left okay so military involvement in politics very very important and it continues to be throughout the republic um what about charles in this period 1640 to 49 well he tries to arrest five mps in january 1642 um which you could say is the final straw before the civil war he refused he, do, he doesn't accept the Newcastle proposals, and then he tries to make a secret ag agreement with the Scots. And so he's offered quite generous terms by Parliament that he doesn't go along with. Parliament wanted a kind of constitutional monarchy, and Charles was unwilling to concede. He tries to make an agreement with the Scots. That leads to him being given back to the army, and eventually that leads to him, his trial and his execution. Um, in terms of Parliament, Pim's Junto in Parliament, this this Puritan opposition group um, in this period assert their kind of authority, particularly after the long Parliament's called, caused, so between, called, sorry, between uh, 1640 onwards. So they issued the Triennial Act saying that Parliament has to be called every three years to stop absolutism. They have Wentworth um, who's the king's advisor, arrested, um, imprisoned, impeached, and executed. The same with Lord later on, 1645. And then the rump parliament tries and executes the king, okay? Um, which, as we as we talked about just before, that is very much due to military involvement as well at that point. Um, in terms of radicals and internal threats, You've got the Irish Catholic uprising in 1641, which leads to this kind of mass moral panic, kind of chaos in England, this fear of um, Catholicism. 1645 onwards, as I said, the New Model Army, this leveller influence, radical influence in the New Model Army. Um, that can be seen in the Putney debates of 1647, where the army and the levellers try and negotiate a new constitutional framework. Nothing comes out of that. But ideas like the abolition of the House of Lords are discussed there, which does happen after the execution of the king. 1649 and the execution of the king, you could say, leads to this outburst of radicalism. So you've got the ranters, who are the most radical group, and then you've got groups like the diggers as well, um, who are you know completely challenging the social order of the time. In 1649, also, you've got the failed level of mutiny at Burford. And that shows how much the government is kind of reliant on the army to keep control these these outbursts of violence that the that the army is then used to to quash um so in this period military involvement actions of the king actions of parliament and then kind of radical challenge so um questions that you could think about once you've kind of analyzed those and weighed up the relative importance again think about the dates think about you know look at how things change and so military involvement probably isn't as important till after 1645. Um, Parliament is important but then the army kind of takes over you know um, things like that so have a think about that. How far do you agree that, that the actions of Charles I are the most significant cause of his execution? So was it actions of the king? Was it actions of Parliament? Or was it the actions of the army? I think would be a really good a really good structure for that. Um, military involvement in politics, the most significant cause of political instability. So again, military involvement, actions of the king, radicals, you could you could do that. Um, and then try and make some links. So I hope that was useful. I know I've gone through that quite quickly, but I would suggest, as I said at the start, making timelines. If any of these things you're not sure about, just look them up in the textbook. They're all in there or look them up in this revision. 
uh, this revision book, which I've based these uh, these packs, this pack on, I should say. Okay, thank you.